So our next speaker is Timothy Dick. Timothy grew up on the prairies where the big skies and open spaces inspired his artistic development. This eventually led to an MFA degree in Montreal, and part of that experience was an apprenticeship in bookbinding. Now Tim is a bookbinder living in Durham, Ontario. He is an executive committee member of the Cabbage Health Western Ontario chapter, and he can be found at thecolorjar.ca, where you can get lots of beautiful papers from. <laughs> I'm just going to make sure that Tim's talk, Books as Movie Props, is set up so that our Zoom folks can see it too, and then Tim will start to begin. Thanks, Ariel. It's uh, been a fun day. So great to be here and meet a few people, see some awesome things, and uh, and just generally hang out with uh, people like me. So it's great. Uh, well, I shouldn't say like me. We're all different mixtures, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm a little bit nervous because uh, you know there was obviously so many binders in Canada who have uh, experience doing what I'm going to talk about today. But, you know, I'm just sharing from my experience. So that's what I'm uh, saying to myself. Uh, so about 10 years ago, I took a tour of the Stratford Festival props department on a trip to a, a play there. And I was just in awe the whole time. I was like, oh, this is such a romantic existence, just sitting in this workshop and making beautiful thing or you know weird and wacky things uh, for a living uh, you get to do creative problem solving you get to work as a team and you get to be part of a larger creative production and that's what i think attracted it to me plus you know there's such a variety i love variety and i love uh, new things coming through across my bench um, but since then you know in talking to people uh uh, Don spoke about this in in passing this morning, making uh, props for movies. Although I don't know if Don ever worked in a in a particular production, like an art department, so to speak, probably just on his own. But I'm talking to my sister in law, who's worked in theater all her life, and now teaches theater, it's a very stressful environment. You know, you have deadlines to work on, very short deadlines generally, and. Uh, long hours, late nights, which probably would have killed me a long time ago if I had been in that because I like my bedtime. Um, so anyway, uh, in the end, um, I ended up sort of creating this life for myself, uh, except on my own in my own shop. Uh, we moved to Durham, Ontario after my MFA degree uh, at Concordia. And it was while there studying printmaking that I did an internship with uh, bookbinder Odette Drapeau. And uh, I worked it into my program, so I even got credit for it, which was great. And um, so we moved to Durham. I worked in graphic design for a little while just to pay bills and then uh, ended up purchasing the local art supply shop. I just kind of walked in one day and said, hey, when are you retiring? Uh, he, you know, he was... Uh, a good natured chap uh, and took my question in stride. But in the end, I borrowed some money from my dad and we ended up taking over the shop and I just moved my bookbinding studio into the back of the shop. It's one of these long um, old buildings with the tall ceilings, the beautiful tin ceilings. And um, it was a beautiful space to work in, I thought. So um, it worked out just well. And um, so th since then, um, I've kind of taken on pretty much any kind of work that uh, related to display and presentation on just to make sure that the business paid for itself, whether it be framing, arts, art materials and storage, artifact preservation, and of course, bookbinding. Um, in a small town, one has to wear a few different hats uh, just to uh, you know make it work because you don't have the huge clientele of a city. Uh, so over time, word got around the area that there was this guy who would take on unusual jobs. So, um, you know, everything from fixing an old uh, World War I stretcher to hang on someone's apartment wall uh, and just, you know, weird things. Uh, word got around um, and it has gotten me into hot water sometimes because I took on a job I shouldn't have. But it also paid dividends in uh, a consistent clientele. People are pleased with my customer service, even if uh, sometimes uh, things don't or things cost me money. Like for example, 
Recently, I um, did some mounting work for a guy, a photographer, who had a show um, in Owen Sound, and uh, he was mounting huge, large photos, like four by five feet, and uh, they were all printed on that incredibly matte paper with, you just breathe on it the wrong way, and the blacks just mark right up. And so I really hesitated, but eventually I said, no, I think we can do this. And I took it on, and I did some tests and everything. Anyway, long story short, uh, there were some failures. Uh, most of them worked, some of them failed. So I ended up having to pay out of my pocket to reprint some of them. That's just an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so I should I just want to insert a little note here because I think many of you may know a fellow by the name of Fred Turner, who was a longtime associate of, of uh, Cabbage. And he lived in Durham for a long time. And he was kind of my introduction to Cabbage, actually. Uh, he was a bookseller who interacted with a lot of uh, bookbinders in Toronto for many years and um, eventually retired, semi-retired to Durham, where he sold books. And he had a beautiful old house that he took great care of and let me use one of his back rooms uh, for my binding studio in the beginning. In any case, um, he was a great friend and he recently passed away. I just wanted to mention that in case any of you were interested. Um, so every bookbinder has certain skill sets um, gained over time that make them unique. For example, uh, personally, uh, my personality growing up was, um, I was never super skilled at keeping my workbench spotless, um, but I've had to train myself to do that. Or sometimes I would start a procedure without having all my tools ready to go. Um, but on the other hand, I'm comfortable with a little bit of creative disarray when, when, when it allows, when the situation allows. And I can move really fast when I need to. So these skills or shortcomings, I have other skills to make up for some of those shortcomings. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, these skills or shortcomings open and close doors in life. And um, I think they lead, lead us to the jobs that we end up doing. Um, or sometimes they chase us away from jobs that we shouldn't be doing. Um, so it was really exciting to meet Daniel. I'll just call him Daniel, uh, the props master, art director for the film Wickensburg. Let's see if uh, my arrow buttons are oh, down. Let's try. Is it down sideways? OK. And. Um, Thank you. There we go. It must have just frozen. It was exciting to meet this fellow who walked into my shop one day. He happened to be passing through because he has a, a little home north of Durham. And he noticed my sign saying book binding. Um, he was going to be um, art directing props building for a film called Wickensburg. And uh, the director is from Toronto. The film is essentially Canadian, and it was going to be shot in Perry Sound and at Grieg's Caves near Lion's Head. It's a, essentially a children's movie, so don't get too excited. <laughs> this is like very low budget. But anyway, um, he said that he needed someone to do some, uh, come up with two main books that were going to follow the characters throughout the story, as you can see there, uh, two teenage children on an adventure and also create an illustration that was going to serve as the main spread for the plot. Uh, so I knew it was the right project for me because I had that healthy mix of confidence and trepidation, which is the best mix for good creative results, I think. Um, I'm just going to back up one second just to show, um, I forgot to show these, uh, just a couple of quick passes through some of the work that I've done uh, in recent years. So I do everything from, you know, traditional books um, to uh, stretching canvases for artists, a large, large work, small works, and then, you know, a little print there on the top corner. And then I also uh, recently ventured into teaching BB1, as you can see in the bottom, there's Doug. And uh, that was so fun. I really enjoyed having uh, the keen students in my studio. And then um, as an example of some other various things, uh, working with artists, as Don had said, 
uh, making uh, accordion books. This one was for Charlotte Jones, an artist from Newfoundland. And then, um, you know, touching up weird statuary uh, to making a strange custom holder for a navigational tool for someone's car, you know, just, you know, just weird things. Uh, and then I thought I'd throw in a couple little shots of my art uh, work that I've done over the past couple of years, just to give you a flavor again of my personality um, uh, and uh, the things that I'm interested in. Um, so these were two pieces that I created as part of a, a series. Um, and so talking about the illustration for this or the main illustration for the book, um, when Daniel and I first uh, talked, uh, he told me that the main illustration was going to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse from the Bible. And uh, so I did some various sketches and tried to sketch out some ideas, decided in, you know, the backlighting, the general color scheme and so forth. And he was very cautious. He said, well, they're supposed to be kind of scary, but not too scary because it's for kids, etc." Um, so we worked a lot on that, went back and forth. And then this spread here shows a variety of the different stages in creating the illustration. So the white overlays are the sketches that I use to put the um, transfer or position, carefully position the different horsemen onto the backdrop, so to speak. And then the top right corner shows you uh, the finished transfer and then the development of the illustration. And this process took so long. So one of the things that you'll find when, if you ever get into doing movie work uh, is there's this chain of command. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But we had to go back and forth constantly. Uh, you know, I like this. Do you like this? Oh, let me check with the director, blah, blah, blah. So back and forth quite a bit. Um, and just to prove my point, the next one is the final piece, which shows you a vast... Uh, change from this one to that one. Um, and you'll see the next uh, slides will show an even greater change because once the movie goes to production, the script can change any any time. You know, the director or the producer might say, no, we've had feedback from some of our people that this is way too such and such. We need to change the script. So anyway, um, this was the final illustration done in pastel and gouache uh, that I passed on to him. And it was a good thing that I gave him the original uh, illustration to take along. I carefully packaged it up because he ended up, in the end, he ended up, as you can see, this is a still from the movie. Um, he ended up totally changing it. I had created the illustration to carefully go down, right down into the gutter and, um, and, uh, you know, th as a bookbinder, I'm thinking about these things. Uh, and so in the end, they totally changed the script and the order in which the horsemen were talked about. So they had to rearrange the order of the horsemen. So he scanned the illustration, photoshopped the heck out of it, and ended up just sort of um, tipping it in or pasting it in somehow. And you'll also notice, of course, that the coloring has changed quite a bit. So the lighting has a great impact on how the work that you create um, comes across. So he kind of, Daniel had warned me about all of this and I uh, I was cool with it, you know, as long as uh, they like the end result and of course I get paid, then that's all fine. Um, here's another example of how the illustration shows up in the movie. Uh, it's looked at under, you know, the cover of a, of a bed sheet with a flashlight, so very inconsistent lighting. And, you know, it it um, accentuates the mystery of the whole effect as well. But you can see the order of the horsemen has changed and, uh, you know, we lost some of the detail and so forth. But, ah, uh, well. Here's one of the main characters uh, looking at the book under the cover of the sheets. So as to the books themselves, um, when Daniel told me that the movie plot was going to be set in New England and uh, current or contemporary day, okay, and these were two old books found in a drawer in a an old house, 
And I was right away thinking, okay, it would have been published, say, in Boston. No. And I came up with all these ideas to propose to Daniel how the book should look and based on historical examples. And he's like, no, 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 this is a kid's movie. We're not doing any research. We're not doing anything special here. We're just creating two books that are meant to look old and mysterious. Um, so uh, that, I guess, got me off the hook in one sense, but uh, it was still fun. Um, so we proposed uh, finding old books to modify. So I would just take an old book and color it and change the, uh, the, the um, maybe the end papers or something and uh, a new title page, etc. But in the end, finding the right size of book and the right number of pages, etc., to uh, prove to be too difficult uh, given our time frame. So I said, hey, um, I've got some really cheap paper. We can uh, find some uh, existing books and that are not copyright and uh, copy the pages. And uh, I just basically randomized the pages and put them onto Manila old looking paper. And uh, we'll go with that. So in the end, they were made from scratch, even though the budget didn't call for it. We managed to squeeze it in somehow. And um, they were not, these books were not completely bound to uh, Cabbage BB1 or BB2 standards. But uh, nevertheless, they, they're all hand stitched and they will last through what will, what you'll see is now a second filming. The, the second film is in production now. Um, and so, yeah, at least they got something that uh, the director will be proud to hang on to. As you can see here, if you take a screenshot or stop your movie as you're watching it on television, um, you will notice, of course, that it has nothing to do with Wickensburg. It has nothing to do with what the whole plot is about at all, which I was concerned about when I told him this. Uh, and he said, no, we'll make it work. And this only appears for like one second in the in the film, but still, if you paused it, you know, any historical person uh, would would uh, protest. Um, so how does uh, production, oh, okay, hang on a second. I'm going to, let's see here. Yeah, so I wanna just mention about uh, this. Here's another example of a book um, taken from one of my favorite worlds is uh, Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings and uh, from the film, Lord of the Rings. And uh, obviously these people had a little bit higher budget, a little bit more research, et cetera. Plus it's a fantasy world, so, but there was still a lot to know. Um, it's the scene in Moria where Gandalf is looking at an old book of the dwarven, uh, of the dwarves found in uh, a mine that's been desecrated, et cetera. Anyway, the, I love this photo because it shows what the, uh, uh, art department had to do to this book. I don't know if they um, started from scratch. In fact, I, I wrote an email to Weta Workshop who in New Zealand who did the props and all the, you know, the costuming and, and various things for Lord of the Rings just to ask them who made this book because I really wanted to know. And I've looked online and took them a few weeks to get back to me. And in the end, they said, sorry, we don't have record of that. It was someone in the art department who just whip this thing off. And I'm like, ah, come on, can't you keep some records here? <laughs> so someone obviously didn't get the credit they deserve. There's another reason not to work in an art department. You don't get credit. Um, but I love uh, looking at this nonetheless, because, you know, there's someone has carefully sprinkled dust in between every page and made some slash marks on the side and so forth. However, the binding is quite inflexible, as you can see. So I don't know if it was a book binder or not. Um, here's another shot of the books being discovered in the desk drawer on, on the set. So how does movie production actually work? You have, of course, it's a hierarchical situation. You have the director and the producer, and then all the departments below. Screenwriters, lighting and sound, locations managers, uh, and then there's the art department. The art department encompasses a whole bunch of things from the production designer, art director, set dressers, greens, property manager, 
and the, then the general, just the riffraff like myself who make the stuff. Um, and in this case, the art department was very small. And in fact, one person kind of, Daniel, he encompassed about three different roles in this film, <clears throat> which made for a very challenging uh, few weeks on his part during filming and, and the months before that. Um, but it's also easier for me than I just have to work with one person. Um, so the actors in this particular film, Wickensburg, by the way, Wickensburg is out right now. You can watch it if you, I forgot to look it up before I came, but I think it's HBO or something like that. Uh, you can stream it. Um, again, it's a children's movie, so don't get too excited. Um, it's got a very Disney-like plot and kind of like Scooby-Doo upgraded to Disney sort of level. Um, but anyway, the actors come from the U.S. and Canada. And um, and with the recent Hollywood strikes looming, the director was very smart. He he um, talked to his crew and his cast, and he said, "Okay, you you all have to sign this uh, waiver. If a strike happens, you're still going to be working for me in a few weeks." And I guess he got his wish because production is still ongoing, even though technically they should be on the strike right now. So. Um, that was a little interesting moment because it shortened, again, it shortened our production window. Here's a few more pics of uh, <clears throat> the main boy character in his bedroom looking at the book. And then here's the two of them interacting. In this film, the two main characters, the kids uh, living in a fictional town, meet and start to solve a mystery seemingly laid out for them by some long forgotten resident. Um, the books, along with clues cunningly hidden in a local in local statuary. So in the background, you can see a statue <clears throat> which was created for the film, um, has a secret compartment on it, and they get clues from the book which help them open the secret compartment and they find amulets and, you know, you get the picture, right? Um, <clears throat> the boy's mom, who is a, a journalist, uh, eventually, un they together uncover an evil plot by the villain in the story, Mr. Hexenmeister. Here's another few shots. Um, this was at Grieg's Caves. And if you ever want a nice hiking adventure, Grieg's Caves up on the Bruce Peninsula is an amazing place to go. Uh, it's great for, for exploration of the uh, um, escarpment. Um, here's a place on the coast um, of, is it Georgian Bay? Perry Sound is on Georgian Bay, right? Yeah. Uh, the the female character here, you can see her in her gothic type of dress. She's my favorite character, except they make her change at the end, which was really disappointing. But apparently in the second film, she goes back to her, her other character. So speaking of the second film, <clears throat> now we're going to transition into talking about that. Um, about a month or so ago, Daniel contacted me to begin work on the props for the second film. This time, the jobs were smaller, not huge books, but the list was longer. So one book they needed was big and old, no surprise. Uh, and Daniel and I proposed maybe finding an old book like a, uh, you know, something that's very common, like a, a large family Bible, which are usually easy to find. And I could, I, I proposed heavily modifying it, so that's obviously not a Bible. Um, but the director apparently knows his TV audience well in the U.S. because he replied that he doesn't want to alienate many of his U.S. customers who evidently would recognize even the proportions of one of these books. So we scrapped that idea and started again. Um, uh, Daniel had a whole collection of old encyclopedias, so... Um, a battered leather leather copy, and so we ended up using that. Um, but the other items on the list were maps, uh, lots of maps and various pages, which were going to be added to the original red and blue Wickensburg books. So for this one was going to turn into a fold-out map that um, is found inside one of the books. And so for this map, he just, this is actually a, an original map of the University of Durham, I think, in England. And uh, he contacted the artist and purchased a copy of this digitally, but the artist had to flip the whole thing um, 
digitally, 100% or flipped over so that it doesn't pose any copyright problems. And if you look carefully, you'll see backwards words on it. That shows you again the care, uh, the level of care that is not uh, present. But they did change the main things like the title and so forth. But um, my job was to make it old looking and to stick it into the book as a fold out. So here's the finished product um, with the fold lines nicely sanded and and uh, degraded and then tipped in. And, you know, I've seen some pretty nice old books uh, with fold out maps and they tend to be in terrible shape. You know, they tend to uh, have lots of tears from people mismanaging or mishandling them. Um, so uh, many of you will be very familiar with that. Uh, so I tried to mimic that as best I could. And what I used was a mixture of uh, watercolor and acrylic ink and dirt generally. And then I mounted um, the on the back on some of the maps, not the one you just saw, but on some of the maps were taken from old uh, like Ontario atlases published in the 1800s, uh, Dominion of Canada or whatever that kind of stuff. And so I had to mount uh, or to paste something over the back side of it to cover the illustration, the lithograph on the back, and extend the the inner the spine side so that it could be properly tipped in and so forth. So um, in order to do that, I used, as you can see, Yes Paste, which I've done some experimenting with. It's a commercially available paste. I don't know if any of you have worked with it. I keep meaning to ask people if they've had experience with it um, because it is super great for mounting things that need to stay absolutely flat with no stretching or no, no anything. It's a dextrin-based adhesive. <clears throat> So maybe some of you can fill me in on the technical um, shortcomings of it. But for unimportant things, it works really well. Um, and I just roller it on. You have to keep it unmodified for it to keep its lay flat properties. You can't add water to it. So I use a roller to, to roll it on. And then <clears throat> in the bottom right corner is the finished product, which I've carefully or not carefully, I tried to get them a little bit crooked um maps that were going to be tucked in so here's the finished wickensburg map uh, with the extension on the right on the left hand side you can see where the backing paper i've i've added to extend it that's the shin inbei paper by the way uh, which has a beautiful color to match old old documents like this and then in that top gap the top left hand corner of the map they're going to the kids are going to place an, an amulet or an orb of some sort, and then they're going to CGI a line right across the map, and it's going to expose a location on the map where they have to go to. So I changed the name on the top, of course, before that said Glanford or something. And I, as you can see here, used a sand eraser to get majority of the ink off and then changed it, <clears throat> trying to match the type, of course. Um, these would have been, I mean, a lot of you people would know the history of, or the, the technical ways these were created better than I do, but, um, I think these would have been either the main part would have, or the type would have been an etching of some sort. And then, uh, I don't know. Yeah, probably an etching for the map as well. Right. Uh, the bottom right corner shows one of the pages that I was to insert and um, I was using walnut ink um, to augment uh, some of the pages that they showed to me. I can't show you tons about it because I'm under a vow of secrecy, but um, <clears throat> I can show you a little snippet here uh, that I was just overlaying some walnut ink onto the um, printouts that they provided, that Daniel provided me. And uh, yeah, that was fun too. And then here's the process of, uh, okay, so the next part, uh, the next series of slides will show the ledger. I had to create a, a fictional ledger from the town that was found in the basement of the newspaper in the town. And uh, uh, again, um, some of you maybe can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, or if my historicity is quite spot on, 
but they provided me with the text block. They were like, no, we can't afford to pay you to make a text block. So we're just going to take this. This is like a, one of these um, pulpy um, sketchbooks that are made in Asia. And um, uh, so the paper is probably made in Thailand, I'm guessing. Anyway, I just trimmed it. And then each page I went and colored. So here's me doing my color tests on, on the offcuts of the paper and uh, trying to blotch it nicely. And then in process, getting it uh, nice and blotchy. I did each page, but they couldn't afford to have me do each page. But I ended up doing about four or five spreads like this, where I um, carefully you know, created um, oily marks and watermarks, etc. And then uh, I looked up uh, the genealogical records for like Eastern Pennsylvania or something like that, and just took names that I could find because they needed me to put Hexenmeister in there. So you, you can see halfway down the page, Hexenmeister. So I just inserted that fictional name into all of these real historical names. Um, and I just did about four or five spreads like this, uh, which was very fun. Um, <clears throat> I love handwriting. I lo I've read a few books on graphology just out of interest. And so I love um, studying uh, the history of handwriting and so forth. Um, recently, I did a little bit more research. Uh, oh, yeah. And then here's the nearly finished ledger. I did a little bit more work to it after this photo. Um, but... Um, that was a lot of fun. I did a little bit of research on other people who do uh, work in the field of movie props, paper props, and things like that, and found a great little um, video that I can share with people. Um, if you want to get a flavor of what it's like to create paper, I mean, you think about <clears throat> if you watch TV and movies, uh, every little piece of paper that shows up in that film has been specifically or should be specifically chosen for that occasion. And if there's budget for it, and if there's care put into the film, they will actually put some effort into um, how that paper was created and the type and so forth. So anyway, um, this fellow that I was watching about, uh, his name's Ross McDonald, he um, he has a studio is totally dedicated to paper movie prop production. So he has every press known to humankind, and uh, you know uh, everything from Gestetners to typewriters of various kinds. And he creates everything from movie tickets from you know 1930s to whatever you just imagine it, and he creates it. And so I love that. It's sort of renewed my interest um, in that sort of work. Uh, I'm really glad that I've had the opportunity to work in this environment as it has drawn on so many of my interests. And even though it sometimes makes me sweat, um, you know, deadlines looming, et cetera, uh, I still get paid to have some fun with it. So um, if anyone has any questions, I can take those. And thanks for your ears. Yes, online Marilyn Book asks, how long does it take to do a book like The Ledger? Uh, well, because I didn't have to stitch this one, um, it shortened, uh, or, you know, I didn't even have to source the paper. They just handed it to me, essentially. Um, I had to, I did spend, you know, a, a morning doing color preparations, uh, coloring the paper, and trying to, you know, in a minimal way, get the edges a bit rough looking and so forth. And then I did a bunch of research, like I said, for the um, for the names and the um, the handwriting, etc. And I looked up, you know, old examples of ledgers, land ledgers, and so forth. And uh, and then did the actual calligraphy. So all in all, it probably took me about ten hours for that particular book. But the um, the other two books in the other film that uh, oh, I was talking about, they would have taken much longer. I think in the article um, that I wrote, uh, by the way, this sort of version of this talk 
appears in the latest Book Arts magazine. And um, in that in that article, I talked about the the type or the font chosen for the uh, front covers, the Wickensburg <laughs> social history of Wickensburg. And uh, we had, you know, I have a I have a fairly big type collection, which I inherited from Fred Turner, by the way, and um, which was amazing. And in it, uh, I sent them a few samples and they came back and they liked a particular one. So um, I, I, again, I didn't question their judgment. I just did it. So. <laughs> and then Brian Queen asks, does this type of work pay more or less than standard bookbinding? Um, that's a good question. I would say that what happens, I, I, and Don Taylor, you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if Don's here or not. Okay. Or other people who've done work like this. Uh, but from what I understand, you start with your budget and then you work backwards. You sort of say, well, how much time is this going to take me? What are my material costs? And then you sort of expand to fill that. <laughs> um, so, uh, Whereas in generally, when I get a, a piece of work from someone, they just come to me and place it on my desk and I look at it briefly and I say, well, I don't know how much is this is going to be, but it's going to be approximately this much. And then um, if it's going to be vastly different for that client, then I have to phone them and, and tell them, well, do you want me to go on with this or should we revert? So in other words, my, my answer is, is that with the movie work, it seems to me you start with a set fee and you have to uh, work within that framework. Whereas uh, with general customers, uh, they sometimes will have an upper limit. They'll say, oh, I can't spend any more than $200 on this. Um, but other times they're just waiting to hear what I would say about it and say, well, this would probably be about that much. So I would say it is different, um, probably, if you worked in the depths of what a workshop uh, in New Zealand, you probably get paid an hourly rate and you just have to get the work done, whether you're paid or not, or, or sorry, whether, um, not whether you're paid or not, but whether you um, have final say in the outcome or not. Uh, so I guess for myself working this way, it's nicer because um, I don't have the pressure of the director breathing down my neck. I'm dealing with the art director, so. Are there any other questions online or in person? What I'm curious about is, we'll refer back to that ledger. If you had the scenario where you were in control of the paper and you were in control of the binding, so you would know what papers you're working with and how they might interpret if you were trying to age them or antique them right. versus what you were describing where here you go, here's something, age yeah. it. So you really don't know the nature of the paper and how it's going to interpret. So my fear would be you've put that work into it, you've colored them, you've done that, and they go, yeah, no. So yeah. how does that then work with respect to them in control of the materials that they're giving you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in this case, I was lucky, I guess. And um, Daniel liked everything I did or else he was a really good liar um, because, uh, you know, he, he said, you know, thanks for all your work. You've been great. Um, um, but yeah, if I was in charge of it from the very beginning, I probably would have consulted some of the paper conservators here and gotten a little bit more well-versed in the historical examples and so forth. Um, because yeah, it's not my specialty. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, but it is a different dynamic for sure. And, uh, you know, I can I can always fall back on it and say, well, it didn't work because you provided me with bad stuff. I mean, if you look carefully at that last photo, you'll see it's kind of pilly. The paper is very pulpy paper, and it didn't have too much sizing in it. Um, so whenever I tried to work with it, it would just pill up and get all mushy kind of, uh, you know, not to comment on the paper, but it's just that that's the reality. So it didn't behave in the same way a paper produced in New England in the 1700s would have behaved, right? 
Any other questions for Tim? There's a, a comment for you in Zoom, but not a question, so I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions in person? All right, I don't see any more questions online um, or in person. So we'll thank you again for your time and your talk, Tim. Mm. Oh, you're welcome.